post-independence era, there was an unprecedented enthusiasm for Catholic missions in Ireland. Consequently, many orders of nuns were founded for this very purpose. These congregations offered um, the opportunity for religious women to train um, and practice, to train as nurses and doctors and to practice medicine in the mission fields of Africa and Southeast Asia. This presentation examines the relationship between these missionary sisters and the hierarchy of the Irish Catholic Church. This hierarchy, composed of one national cardinal and then 26 diocesan bishops, disseminated the rule of the Pope across Ireland. However, these new congregations of missionary sisters, despite obtaining support from the Vatican, consistently had to negotiate the restrictive regulations implemented by these Irish bishops. <clears throat> I suggest that this tension reveals the wider complica complications in the church between its theologically informed universal perspectives and its local hierarchical operations. Excuse me, <clears throat> In considering this, I take particular note of the work of Dennis Cosgrove, who reflected on the historical importance of the universal vision um, and particularly regarding missionary expansion within the Catholic Church. To expose some of these complexities, I specifically focus on the following congregations. <clears throat> okay. Firstly, the Medical Missionaries of Mary. They were founded in 1937 by Mary Martin. Secondly, the Missionary Sisters of St. Columbia, founded in 1921. To a lesser extent in the course of my thesis, I've also looked at the St. Louis Sisters and the Missionary Sisters of Our Lady of Apostles. Now these latter two are actually French in origin and from, and are from the 19th century as well, but nonetheless it was from their Irish provinces that, they, um, that their missionaries went out to Africa from about the 1940s. To mould secular women into suitable Missionary Sisters, all these orders were dependent on specific spaces. This includes their mother house, which was to be the emotional and administrative centre of the congregations. Next, the novitiate, usually located within the mother house. This was where the spiritual training of the sisters would occur over a two year period. Next, uh, to fulfil their professional obligations, the sisters also opened hostels in Dublin, and from here, the student sisters could live and attend university courses in the city. And then lastly, um, unique to the MMM order, the sisters commissioned and supervised the, the construction of, uh, of their own hospital. This was called the International Missionary Training Hospital. Now this paper today explores these specific spaces to pursue three key themes. Firstly, I considered the hierarchy of the Irish Catholic Church, and particularly how the sisters worked within this. I explore this through the MLM's efforts to gain permission from an Irish bishop to locate their mother house in the diocese. My second key theme examines the pervasive power of the, sis of the bishops over the sisters. This is done by exploring how the bishops control entrances and exits to the mother house and hostel. And my final theme considers the universal perspectives adopted by the sisters. And I think I want to contrast this to the views of the bishops. I do this by focusing on the INTH, the International Missionary Training Hospital. Collectively, these themes hint at the usefulness of considering various scales and spaces within the Catholic Church as a way to critique the hierarchical power through which it operates. Now my first key theme, the hierarchical operations of the Church in Ireland. Pictured here is the founders of the MMM congregation, Mary Martin, alongside some key dates for the order. To 1921 and 1923, she was a lay missionary nurse in Nigeria before ill health forced her to return home to Ireland. Yet far from being deterred, her experiences in Nigeria strengthened her belief that medical work administered by women to women would successfully spread the church throughout Africa. And she became resolved to establish an Irish congregation that would be solely dedicated to this purpose. Over the following 14 years, she gathered both like-minded recruits for the cause, as well as the support from various senior church figures. However, to continue to grow, the MMMs had to acquire the patronage of a diocesan bishop, where their mother house and novitiate could be located. In 1936, Mary Martin wrote, 
The erection of the MMM into religious society is absolutely requisite. And from her personal correspondence, it is clear she was worried about not being taken seriously unless the MMMs were, were a legitimate religious society. One of her advisors, Monsignor Ribéry, once wrote to her to say that the vital thing was to have definitive status within the church, the undermined vital to hammer home his point. Another advisor of Mary Martin, her personal friend, Monsignor Moigna, wrote to her praying that the MMM may be blessed in its inception by God through the voice of the Holy See and the voice of the hierarchy in Ireland. Moigna's letter reveals the operations of the church with power filters down from Vatican to the national and ultimately to the diocesan level. However, despite receiving approval from the Vatican, Mary Martin received many rejections from Irish bishops who were reluctant to admit the MMMs into their diocese. It was suggested to Mary that this lack of support was because the role of medical nuns was not fully appreciated by the bishops. Indeed, Moigna wrote to her to say, an institute of nuns doing medical work is altogether new, and I can easily foresee that the bishops in Ireland might be extremely reluctant to admit such a congregation. The multiple rejections received um, to Mary Martin reveals the complex geographic and hierarchical operations of the church, and how its direction, as dictated by, from the Vatican, was not always enacted at the diocesan level. Mary Martin herself keenly observed this, when she wrote that the wishes of the Vatican and the hierarchy in Ireland were, in her own words, two things which have for so long seemed incompatible. From her correspondence, Mary Martin appears to possess almost limitless ambition for the MMMs, but while remaining aware of her powerlessness within this church. She even toyed with the idea of establishing the novitiate in Nigeria, or actually as well England, because she received encouraging letters from bishops there, much more supportive to the missionary cause than their Irish counterparts. During this frustrating period of seeking what she classed as a good benefactor for MMM, she stressed that she wished no clash with the Irish hierarchy. Eventually, however, Mary Martin succeeded in avoiding such a clash because she gained the approval of Cardinal Joseph McGrory. He consented to allow the MMMs to locate their novitiate in his archdiocese. This was quite the mark of success for the MMMs because Carl McRory was the most superior person in Ireland's Catholic hierarchy. The importance of his support was noted in a congratulatory letter sent to Mary from the Vatican and it spread. The news that, with the paternal interest of his eminence, Cardinal McRory, you have succeeded in opening in Ireland the Novitiate for Institute, has given me much consolation, as it shows that God, with a manifest mark of his help, is blessing your endeavours for the good of our missions. From many informal accounts, it appears that Mary Martin and Cardinal McRory enjoyed a close friendship. Mary Martin's own personal charm and upper-class background perhaps gave her the confidence to engage with the bishops in a personal manner. Monsignor Moigna also acknowledged to Mary Martin the benefits of having this cardinal support, and he wrote to say to her, the fact of having the wholehearted approval of the cardinal, a great national figure and a home in his archdiocese, puts you at once um, right at the forefront of societies that depend on the charity of the Irish people. Monsignor Moigna goes on to say that the acquisition of McRory's support was due to Mary's childlike trust in her missionary endeavour. With the Cardinal's approval, the MMMs eventually established themselves in Drogheda. This is their mother house that they built and lived in there. Um, to obtain the Cardinal as a benefactor proved to be successful for the MMMs. From this site, the sisters were able to construct the International Mission Training Hospital and they continue to occupy this mother house today. I now want to move on to my second key theme, the intricacies and pervasiveness of the bishop's power over the sisters. I think this is the best evidence in the bishop's regulations regarding the mother house and hostels. Shown here is the mother house of the Columban sisters. It was in a secluded location in the townland of Caracol near Ennis. Sisters moved here with the establishment of their congregation in 1921 when they were granted permission by Bishop Fogarty of the Archdiocese of Killow for the congregation to move, to move here. To preserve this mother house as a religious and gendered space, secular men were forbidden from entering certain parts of the mother house without the permission of the bishop. 
This can be illustrated in this letter sent in 1938 by the Mother Superior of the Columban Sisters. She wrote to Fogarty to request special permission to allow non-religious men to enter the cell of a sick sister. The reasons were given that it may not be possible to accommodate her on the ground floor. I was wondering whether his lordship would allow a couple of our men to come upstairs on Sunday morning to carry sister down to mass. While I do not have the bishop's response, there certainly appears to be a gendered element to this. For men to enter the female space of the congregation was a particular breach of the seclusion of this space. The diocesan bishops also enforced rules that kept the sisters, and particularly the novices, confined to these convents. In Caracol, there was a case when a novice Columban sister needed medical treatment, yet her superior had to seek specific permission from Bishop Fogarty to allow her to leave the convent. And she wrote to him to say, I am very sorry to have to report to you that another novice is threatened with appendicitis and we are anxious to send her to Limerick for operation on Monday. As we are anxious to have your Lordship's permission for Sister Mary Damien to go to hospital, I will ask one of our men to call for a reply when he is in Ennis tomorrow. The need to request permission to seek this medical attention demonstrates the seriousness with which the nun's access to public space is regulated by the bishop. It is also clear that this permission was not just a formality, but something which Bishop Fogarty was keen to enforce. In another example, he once wrote a letter to a Columban priest complaining of the behaviour of Mother Patrick, the Mother Superior, and he wrote to say, According to the regulations that I have made, and of which she must be aware, she is not allowed that special permission for me to go to Foxford. I refuse her that permission and expect her to return directly to her convent at Carrefour. Her system of doing what is irregular first and then after to ask my permission must henceforth stop once and for all. The necessity of applying the bishop's permission to complete tasks beyond the convent strongly implies that a nun's place was within the mother house and not in public space. The regulations preventing the nuns from interacting with the secular world were particularly enforced when they were in their Dublin hostels and under the supervision of Archbishop John Charles McQuaid. McQuaid controlled the Archdiocese of Dublin between 1940 and 1972, and he proved to be a tough benefactor to the missionary congregations. For example, shortly after the Columban sisters opened their own hostel in Merrion Square, McQuaid wrote to the Mother Superior to state, I would advise that your congregation try to settle into the landscape very quietly after the manner of other congregations who have been given by me the privilege of being admitted into my diocese. In no uncertain terms, McQuaid set out his authority over sisters. This included ensuring that they had a minimum presence in the urban landscape. Thus, the sisters were not allowed to be seen on the, up, on the city streets after 8pm, 8 8 PM, regulations which McQuaid said must be safeguarded. They were, however, allowed to attend lectures, but only if certain precautions were taken. A superior of the St. Louis sisters who wished some of her sisters to attend evening classes at UCD, explained to McQuaid that we would arrange for the sisters to come home by taxi on late evenings. In a similar manner, when requesting permission to speak at a late evening Legion of Mary meeting, Sister Bayani of the Columban sisters wrote to McQuaid to ask, would we be considered off the streets if we travelled there and back in a car? <laughs> the response given by McQuaid read, I approve, in a car you were not on the streets. <laughs> The regulations that confine the sisters to their hostel after 8 pm serve to remove their presence from the nighttime landscape of the city of Dublin. Their position in a car was acceptable to McQuaid, but they would not be interacting with this urban environment. To seek permission from the bishop to leave them hostel or mother house demonstrates the pervasive aspects of regulation prevailing in the church. It reinforced the sacredness of the convent and the corrupt nature of the world beyond. However, it does perhaps seem odd to confine sisters to these spaces when these very same sisters would soon be embarking onto the missions. <clears throat> I now move on to discuss my final theme, how despite their confinement in these convents, the congregations actually embraced a universalist outlook. I particularly want to explore how this led to some tension with the local perspectives adopted by the bishops. McQuaid consistently demonstrated a reluctance to allow missionary congregations in the Dublin Archdiocese because he disapproved of these orders siphoning off public donations. 
Consequently, when he did grant permission for the Columbus Sisters Hostel, this was to be under condition that the sisters shall not collect any money in the diocese without the express written permission of the Archbishop. He once wrote to Mary Martin, Mary Martin now known as Mother Mary, explaining his refusal to allow her to collect funds in Dublin, and he said, you will understand that Dublin is already overwhelmed with every manner of missionary collection. My council will scarcely favour the diocese be opened up to a still another and a very active agency of collection. Perhaps though, the most obvious example of this tension is the construction by the MLMs of the International Missionary Training Hospital. This uh, hospital, in quite an arresting modernist style, located next to the Mother House in Drogheda, was opened in 1956. It was intended as a place where the MLM sisters could train as nurses and doctors before embarking on missions. It was an expensive venture costing £550,000, of which much of his funds was given by the public. But Craig was very sceptical about this, and he once wrote that she, meaning Mother Mary, wants to crack open Dublin for her Drogheda project. Mother Mary was once actually issued with a warning of, of McQuaid, and she was told that his grace will not tolerate the direction of any appeal activities in the Diocese of Dublin by any committee external to this diocese. However, Mother Mary herself did not view the INTH as a local project. If anything, the very opposite was envisioned. Here Pratt is taken from the promotional book of the MMS. You can see the INTH in the top corner of the map of Ireland behind. <clears throat> Pictures like this, which show the outward flow of medicine and sisters to the world, and particularly focused on Africa, were accompanied with such extracts as this. The INTH is in Ireland, and practically all its patients are Irish. Its main purpose, its raison d'etre, is not primarily for the benefit of the Irish people. For whom then was it built, one, one, one might reasonably ask. The answer is for the benefit of the people of Africa. For the MMM congregation, this hospital was, for what they termed on, an anomalous situation. It was to be a practical demonstration of Catholic universality, where spirituality transcended boundaries and connected people. To study these missionary spaces, the, the Mother House, the Hostel, the IMTH has allowed me to offer some conclusions of my key themes. Firstly, by securing the approval of Cardinal, the MMM successfully navigated through the opposition they faced from some bishops, and in doing so, they revealed some flexibility to the authority of the Irish Catholic hierarchy. Secondly, the strict regulations over the Mother House and Hostels demonstrates the role of the bishops in creating specific and gendered religious spaces. These spaces thus existed in contrast to the secular world beyond. And then last, finally, in both their actions and their promotional material, the MMM subscribed to universal ideals of the church, a transnationalism that extended beyond the boundaries of the diocese. To study the creation, location, and operation of potentially mundane missionary spaces, I argue can actually reveal the intricacies of a vast hierarchy, one that was laid in the power on an even gendered relations.